Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. Simone Biles has pulled out of her second Olympic competition in two days to focus on her mental health. The gymnastics star will not compete in the individual all-around final after withdrawing from the team final yesterday. So will she take the mat again in these Olympics? We have the latest from Tokyo. Meanwhile, the Department of Justice has authorized former Trump administration officials to testify before the January 6th Select Committee without claiming executive privilege. The committee's first hearing featured emotional testimony from officers describing the violence they saw and experienced that day and calling out lawmakers who downplayed it. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. The officers are now asking the committee to uncover who was responsible for the riot and why it took so long to send help. And President Biden is scheduled to travel to Allentown, Pennsylvania today, where he'll give remarks on the importance of American manufacturing and buying American-made products. We'll bring that to you live when it happens this afternoon. And the CDC is now advising vaccinated people in areas with high transmission to wear masks indoor public spaces. The agency says the reversal is due to new data showing the Delta variant behaves unlike any other we've seen. Eva Pilgrim has the latest. Overnight, Pfizer CEO Albert Burla making the case for booster shots, saying some studies suggest the Delta variant challenges the vaccine's protection after six months, talking to former White House advisor Andy Slavitt in a podcast. We can see that uh, there is a drop in uh, the protection of uh, infections and there is a drop in the protection against hospitalizations, but only for people or mainly for people that they are six months, uh, uh, that they did six months ago their second dose. The variant now responsible for an estimated eight in 10 cases as we learn who is in those hard hit hospitals. ABC calling 50 hospitals in 17 states. Of the 271 COVID patients in the ICU, 255 were not vaccinated. This as the CDC changing its mask guidance, advising that fully vaccinated people return to wearing masks indoors in areas of high transmission citing new science that shows even some vaccinated people can transmit the Delta variant. GMA spoke to CDC Director Rochelle Walensky about the new guidance earlier this morning. We did over this last several days now see new science that demonstrated for those who are vaccinated that they could in fact transmit if they are one of those rare breakthrough infections. So that's new. And more vaccine mandates could be on the way. President Biden saying they are considering the requirement for all federal employees. Diane? All right, Eva Pilgrim, thank you. And I want to bring in ABC News medical contributor and infectious disease specialist, Dr. Todd Ellerin, for more on this. Dr. Ellerin, thanks for joining us. I want to start with this guidance from the CDC, now urging even vaccinated Americans in high transmission areas to wear masks. What do you think? Diane, good morning. I think this does make sense. Remember, close to nine, yesterday there were over 100,000 new cases in the United States. The majority of those we know have that Delta signature, and only half the U.S. is vaccinated. Now we're hearing from the CDC new science that says, and I've personally seen this, that patients who are fully vaccinated can come in and can have very high amounts of virus, like billions of copies of virus in the back of their nose, um, despite full vaccination. So with all of those things in place, Play, I think it makes sense to have indoor masking for those of us who live in warm or hot zones in the U.S. Of the 156 million Americans who are fully vaccinated right now, there have been an estimated 153,000 symptomatic breakthrough cases. So what do those numbers tell you in terms of how the vaccine is doing against COVID in general, but also against the Delta variant? Right. Well, it says that vaccine breakthroughs are still uncommon. Um, it's true. There is some reduced efficacy um, against infection, especially with this Delta signature. But the clear takeaway is that the full vaccine regimens work against, you know, protect us against the worst outcomes, no matter what variant infects them. That's the key message I want people to understand. And the CDC is also now advising that everyone in schools wear masks, which is a change from earlier guidance that said vaccinated students and staff could be maskless. So here's the CDC's director explanation for this on Good Morning America. Take a listen. 
I'm a parent too and I want our kids to have a normal school year. So we are continuing to lean in and say the children can and should be back to full-time in-person learning in the fall as long as those protection measures are in place. So as we head into the school year with more Delta, more disease, more transmission even among those vaccinated and the vast majority of people in these schools not yet vaccinated, we felt it was prudent to make sure our kids can have a normal school year and to have them masked to, um, to be, stay safe. Now, Dr. Eller, it didn't take very long to go from kids don't have to wear masks in schools anymore to now they do. So do you think we could see this advice continue to progress and end up back at encouraging remote learning? Or are you still confident kids will be back in the classroom this fall? Obviously, Rochelle and the CDC are taking this very seriously. They, they're protecting our health, and, sh and she wants our kids to be in school. We can't think of masking as a punishment. We know that kids, when they're masking in school, whether they're vaccinated or not, protect against transmissions in the school. So it just makes sense at a time when, when cases are surging, when most children are unvaccinated at, at this time, it, you know, it just makes sense for our, for our kids to mask when they're in school, and that will allow them to stay in school so we don't have to have the distance learning because we know how we feel about that. Now, the CEO of Pfizer is also raising some doubts about the duration of its vaccine's protection against COVID after six months saying a booster shot might be needed. So that six-month mark is approaching for a lot of Americans. What do you make of that? Should we be worried? Should we need, do we need to get on this booster shot thing? Well, you know, I think that overall, as we're seeing um, a reduction in the infect effectiveness of, of um, the vaccine against protecting for cases, so we're seeing cases rise, I, I do think that the booster may be in our future. But I do want to remind everyone that, that against the worst outcomes and severe illness, these vaccines are working unbelievably well. So, yes, it's time. It may be time in our future that we're going to need a booster. I think that we'll start with immunocompromised compromised patients. One day it may be, you know, the rest of us. But still remember, you know, half the country is unvaccinated. So I think the most important step is for those people to get their first dose of vaccine. And there'll be plenty of time to talk about boosters later. But I, I think it's something that that uh, may be in our future. Now, Dr. Allen, with more than half the country now vaccinated, is there any chance we go back to where we were a year ago? And how else do we avoid that? Diane, you have heard me say this before. The worst is behind us. Why? Because at least half of our country is vaccinated. And again, you know, we hear that the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine used to be 95%, and then Israel is saying 64%. And now the latest data from Israel is saying 39%. But remember, the majority of people who are vaccinated are protected against getting hospitalized, getting into that intensive care unit, which we still have some patients up there in, in my system and of course against death. So yes, it, 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 it's true that we're seeing more cases, but remember these vaccines have been so powerful that um, we're not going to be back to where we were last winter. That's not going to be happening in, in my prediction. All right, Dr. Todd Ellerin, always great to have you. Thank you. Take care, Diane. And coming up, we look at U.S. gymnastics star Simone Biles' decision to withdraw from another Olympic event to focus on her mental health. Also ahead, the U.S. women's swim team had a big night. Star swimmer Katie Ledecky took home the gold. Meanwhile, U.S. men's basketball, well, they came back in a big way. We have the Olympic highlights right after this break. Back, USA Gymnastics says it wholeheartedly supports Simone Biles' decision after the star gymnast announced she's withdrawing for the Olympic all-around finals to focus on her mental health. It's still unclear if she'll compete in any further events. Meanwhile, last night was a big night for Team USA as American swim star Katie Ledecky took home gold in the women's 1,500-meter freestyle. Americans Alex Walsh and Katie Douglas also took home the silver and the bronze in the 200-swim medley. And on the basketball court, the U.S. men's team beat Team Iran 120 to 66. Amy Robach is in Tokyo with more on some Olympic highlights. 
This morning, we're hearing from some of the first Team USA stars who are bringing home the hardware. I mean, it's a lifelong dream just to be at the Olympics and to be able to say that we medaled at the Olympics is pretty, pretty crazy. Synchronized divers Delaney Schnell and Jessica Parado are taking home silver, becoming the first U.S. women to ever medal in the event. The pair teaming up to compete together just 10 days before the start of the trials. It's pretty crazy when people say it out loud to us. <laughs> we don't really realize it was such a short amount of time. Obviously, it was a really good call, and, you know, we've just kind of been moving that momentum forward and just really confident in each other, trusting in each other, and it's been great. And with skateboarding making its Olympic debut here in Tokyo, American Jagger Eaton is taking home bronze. I know you were pretty nervous in the hours leading up to the actual competition. I was nervous and, I, and you know, for me, the only pressure that there is in competition is the pressure that you put on yourself. And I put a lot of pressure on myself to do well. And I'm just grateful to come out with a medal. Right after the I'm competition. Never, never oh, leaving my they, side. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> never leave my side. But it's the U.S. swimmers making a splash with medals under their caps. Among them, 25-year-old University of Georgia alum Jay Litherland. First of all, from one dog to another dog. Hey, go dogs, yeah. Go dogs. Congratulations. It was really in the last 15 meters of the race where you just came out of nowhere and boom, took the silver. What was going through your mind when you're in the pool? I think that last push is more like, all right, let's just, let's just put it on fate. I heard the Team USA, my teammates going crazy. So I just kind of went with that. Amy Robach in Tokyo, thank you. And for more on the games, let's bring in Kenneth Moten in Tokyo. Kenneth, good morning, good evening to you. The, uh, the big news out of Tokyo, of course, is Simone Biles pulling out of the all-around finals. What's the reaction there in Tokyo, and what's next for Biles in these games? A lot of love and support for Simone Biles here in Tokyo, Diane. We have seen athletes all addressing it today here at Tokyo 2020, uh, supporting her, saying she needs that time, that mental rest is important. We all know that for a gymnast, it could be a life or death situation when you are catapulting yourself off a vault. And if your mind is not right, uh, you could seriously be injured. And so as they show their love for Simone Biles, we all know is up to Simone Biles for what's next as we try to figure out is she going to compete next week here in Tokyo uh, we know that USA Gymnastics has said that they will evaluate her daily to see if she will compete next week but again this is Simone Biles's decision um, and she says that she will take that time uh, she has been very open very honest about her situation very transparent um, which again is why fans love her so much and they're rooting for her now, everyone's also talking about Katie Ledecky's big win. Uh, so what's on deck for her now? Talk about, oh wait, I saw what you did there. Katie Ledecky, what's on deck for her? That's a good one, Diane. <laughs> uh, yes, talk about whiplash. Whiplash from Katie Ledecky. She failed to, she lost, right? She failed for the first time not to medal. She didn't medal. We were surprised. We were shocked. And then... She turned around, and let me get this right, she won the first ever women's 1500 meter freestyle at the Olympics. She swam 30 laps. I can't even do two, but Kaylee Ledecky really, really showed out in the pool today. Uh, again, talk about whiplash, so exciting. A lot of athletes here looking at her, talking about her as well, but she really impressed folks today. All right, and she's got more events ahead, so a lot of people will be watching her in the pool as those come up. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, Kenneth, Tokyo is reporting its highest number of new COVID infections ever. So what's it like yeah. there in the city? And could this impact the future of the games now that they've already started? Well, yes, they've started. We're taking it day by day here in Tokyo. That's what we've been doing when it comes to our health and safety. That's what the athletes have been doing. And it appears that's what Tokyo 2020 is doing as well. You mentioned the numbers here in Tokyo, more than 3,000 new daily cases. That's the first time ever during the pandemic. Diane, that's just incredible. More than 170 cases, more than 170 positive cases tied to these games. And so Olympic
Pacific officials have been saying what they've been saying and what we reported right here on ABC News Live last week, which is they'll continue to monitor the numbers. They'll try to prevent any outbreaks in the spread of COVID-19. They've been really jumping on things when they've uh, seen, like, for instance, athletes hugging each other without their mask on in the medal uh, ceremony, but then adjusting the rules there. They've been jumping on these types of COVID protocols to make sure the athletes obey the rules here to try to prevent the spread of COVID-19, but they're definitely troublesome numbers. We haven't seen the demonstrations and the protests we saw at the beginning of these games. Uh, maybe that's because as time goes on, the games are here, and Tokyo and the Japanese people are likely saying, let's just get through these games. Of course, we have what, another more than a week to go of these games, but yes, it's very concerning those numbers are so high. And, and Kenneth, I know the weather is not helping either. Tennis matches, we're hearing, are, are mm. now going to begin at 3 p.m. in Tokyo on Thursday instead of at 11 a.m. because of the increasing heat and humidity. There's also a typhoon on the way. So, so how is the weather impacting the games and the athletes? It's hot, Diane. I mean, like <laughs> hot, hot. I'm from South Carolina. I know hot. I know humidity. And it rivals that. I mean, we've had temperatures in the high 80s. Uh, we hit some 90s last week. Uh, the humidity is off the charts. Uh, you go outside and within seconds uh, you are sweating. And so I actually am very happy to talk to you at this time of night. It's uh, around midnight here in Tokyo and it starts to cool down a little bit. You mentioned that typhoon, it made landfall. It actually cooled things down a little bit uh, and it caused some good surf for the surfers when they had their competition just yesterday. Uh, but here it's impacting the athletes. We have athletes who are falling out. They are passing out, Diane. They are suffering from heat stroke. And we have this uh, Daniil Medvedev uh, from Russia who said this uh, during his tennis match. He told the umpire he was visibly upset today when he told the umpire that yes, he could finish the match, but who's going to be held responsible if I die? We actually have Paula Sabosa and they are Badosa from Spain, another tennis player who had to be wheeled off the court because she was suffering from heat stroke. So that's the conditions we're facing here. You mentioned they changed the times of the uh, tennis start time there. That is good news uh, for these athletes, but we have track and field coming up in a few days. That is outside. So many of these sports outside and so many of these athletes are suffering. Wow. Uh, so Kenneth, what events are you watching out for in the next day or two? Well, I like to go to the ones inside because it's so hot here. So if it's inside, there's air conditioning. That's a sport for me, Diane. But swimming, you know, I told you the other day, I love swimming. Love, love, love it. Uh, we saw what Katie Ledecky did. We have seen some incredible competitions when it comes to swimming. So we've got men and women uh, tomorrow from breaststroke to freestyle and uh, relay Love it. I love to see what they can do in the pool. And I love when they're racing because my heart races as well. So I'm all about the swimming and gymnastics as well. All right. Kenneth Moten in Tokyo. We appreciate it, friends. Stay cool. Thank you. And right now, the U.S. is leading the way with 31 medals. 11 of those are gold. China's not far behind with 27 medals, followed by the Russian Olympic Committee with 23. And coming up, we travel to Indonesia, one of the world's most populated nations. The country has been able to avoid large COVID-19 surges until now. Hospitalizations are on the rise, and there's now a new need for oxygen. When we come back, we'll find out what's contributing to the rising cases there. Welcome back. Indonesia is facing a spiraling COVID-19 crisis, now reporting oxygen shortages. Cases and hospitalizations there are now rising after the country had been spared the worst of the pandemic for much of the past year. ABC's Britt Clinton has more on the sudden change. As the Delta variant spreads around the world, parts of Asia that once had the virus under control are now some of the hardest hit. And in Indonesia's capital of Jakarta, excavators can't work fast enough, building plots to bury the dead that keep pouring in. Some patients forced to die at home. The hospitals are overrun and supplies are running low. With only about 6% of the population fully vaccinated, the Delta variant is tearing through the world's fourth most populous country. Indonesia now recording more than 40,000 cases each day, becoming Asia's COVID epicenter. 
On the streets, a clamour for oxygen. Tefitio Pritamo, or Tio, is desperately searching for canisters. Speaking to our producer in Jakarta, he tells us his mother, who has asthma, was turned away from hospital after hospital. She still hasn't been vaccinated. They eventually found a hospital that would admit her. But like so many others in Indonesia, Tio, for weeks, had taken treatment into his own hands. Oxygen in the country is scarce and prices are rising. Before, we could provide each customer up to five tanks of oxygen. Now we have to limit only two tanks per customer so that everyone can get it too. For those on the front line, going to work carries huge risk. More than 100 healthcare workers in Indonesia have died since June. Despite being fully vaccinated with China's Sinovac vaccine, which is less effective than the vaccines authorized in the U.S. Human Rights Watch researcher Andreas Hasono is among those who had the Chinese vaccine but tested positive for COVID. He says his symptoms are mild. His wife, though, hasn't been as lucky. She's had difficulty breathing. I call, she call, uh, stores that sell oxygen canister, zero. Uh, I decided to use Twitter asking for the public help. Uh, I was lucky, someone who just bought an oxygen told me that, why don't you try there? And I managed to get one of the last six canisters there. I go to sleep with the, si the sound of the siren outside my window every night. And every morning, 5 or 6 a.m., I wake up because of the same sound. My wife and I jointly lost more than 40 friends and relatives over the last two months. Hospitals here are overwhelmed. Those lucky enough to get treatment often end up in outdoor COVID wards. Many countries in East and Southeast Asia were initially praised for their handling of the pandemic, but slow vaccination rates and a highly contagious variant is threatening any claims of successfully beating this virus. South Korea has a vaccination rate of only 12.9% and they're in the midst of their worst ever outbreak. This small vaccination centre in Seoul is administering just 40 to 50 jabs a day. A far cry from the mass rollouts in the US. Some are taking it into their own hands, using an app to hunt for leftover vaccines. I set an alarm on this mobile app, and when an alarm pops up, I can make a reservation. But as soon as I open the page after the alarm, it's already taken. I am never able to catch a slot. Lengthy and strict lockdowns also having an adverse impact on business in South Korea, with no end in sight. This jewellery store owner tells us he had to close one store last month. His sales from his remaining store have fallen by half. Six months into the global vaccination program, just about a quarter of the world's population has received a single dose. That's why you've got massive outbreaks going on around the world. People don't seem to hear it. They, they, the, what they're hearing is possibly what they want to hear is, I'm vaccinated now, I can go back to normal. <laughs> you can't. Not until you've sorted out the rest of the world. But some help is on the way. The US is donating millions of doses of the Moderna vaccine to South Korea's military and Indonesian health workers. Those jabs into arms can't come fast enough. Already more people have died from COVID this year than in 2020. It's a critical moment where we are all under threat, but we have really in our hands the abilities to turn it around. But it requires those who've got the power, who've got the resources to share. All right, Britt Clinton in Hong Kong, thank you for that. And that does it for this newscast. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for joining us. And remember, ABC News Live is here for you all day with the latest news, context, and analysis. I'll see you back here at 3 p.m. Eastern with Terry Moran for The Breakdown. Stay safe. Step into an exciting, colorful, wonderfully new world as Walt Disney brings to glowing life the adventures of Alice in Wonderland, based on Lewis Carroll's beloved story.
there are wonderful tunes for your heart, wonderful thrills for your eyes as you share with Alice the wonderful things she sees. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.